And uh, as I mentioned, the reason we go on the journeys and get not, we can go to many of the worlds. That's easy stuff. Parallel dimensions, play in the astral or causal or mental or third planes and all of that, but they're vast planes and you can get distracted and lost in them. What's more important is that we go beyond the emotional plane, which is the astral plane, and go up above the void, which is a barrier between the upper worlds and lower worlds of time and space. When we go back to a pure positive area where there's no negative nature, where we originate, then we start mixing it up with beings that hang out there, that are masters there, that uh, teach by example, and it rubs off on us. So that means we're bringing back to Earth in our limited experience on Earth growing up because people didn't learn any of this. It starts to bring an enlightenment back to Earth, to the life and personality you have here. There is only one way to bring enlightenment into your life, and that's to have direct experience. That's what changes consciousness. Information, data does not change consciousness at all. Even information about this work is enlightening. It gives people the insight to choose to go on journeys or go forward. But the information itself is not what changes a person. They have to go on direct experience journeys themselves. We're meant to get out of our bodies and go out in the universe and explore while we're running a body on Earth, not till at, wait till after you die. What's the point of that? That's silly. When we travel, just so you know, to be clear, we are, as individual spherical beings, what people call soul on Earth, a type of energy that is not nuclear or atomic. It's not DNA, it's not matter, it's not molecules, it's not atoms. It's an energy that is one pure living power that is behind and supporting all the different things that float in it, different dimensions, different realities, different planets, galaxies. The astral plane is an entire another division above the physical universe, but it's just the next step. Causal is another major division above that, mental planes above that. The etheric is a barrier between the bottom of the void and the lower worlds, and it's mostly pure but not free of all negativity. And then there's the void itself. And that was constructed in the beginning to create a barrier between where we came from as pure beings, perfect beings, and when we started playing with bodies in the lower dimensions of time and space over billions of years. Think about it. It's not only difficult and challenging for people to have the courage to step forward to remember who and what they are, which most people are very scared of doing. They're afraid to meet the supreme being as they call it because it's been grained and taught to people that this supreme being has a pitchfork and if you don't do exactly what he says, then off to hell with you kind of thing. Now this is improper and wrong teaching on any planet anywhere because it keeps people far away from being able to return to where they came from. So they're afraid to meet themselves. Subconsciously influenced, afraid. It takes a certain amount of courage each of you have awakened to step forward on these journeys. That's never been able to be suppressed by tyrants or lives or implants or anything. Man. There's still a certain amount of volition we have despite what was done to us. And it's that which this work awakens first. First, people have to have some kind of a grounded understanding of what life is like beyond Earth and in the other dimensions that they've been made to forget or they're afraid to remember. That's first. Then they can start to go on other journeys where they gather momentum and greater courage and greater ability to see things and remember how to see things for themselves in the other realities. So my job, my purpose, is to help you see things that you can't yet see for yourself. Not that you don't have the ability. You do but it needs to be recovered or awakened or made conscious. The only thing in the way of that is fear. 
Fear is artificially and implanted in people. Either by tyrants before you were born here or you picked up fears along the way or made some mistakes in other lives. You know, accidentally killed a lot of people without intention and there's guilt sometimes associated with why people don't want to remember. None of which, there's no God somewhere punishing people as they're taught on earth to pay for the bad karma of their other lives. That is not how it really works at all. If people are taught to put power and imagination into in reincarnation and into maya or illusion, then they create a continuous rounds of incarnations with little or no awareness of where they came from. We end karma, as people call it, or reincarnation cycles being born through in bodies without memory. We end it by being awake enough to stop agreeing with it. We end it by turning our attention away from supporting it. And then your only duty is to return home to the source itself, to prime creator, and, in, and start to become what you're meant to be, which got derailed over billions of years and people have not been returning to the source as they promised and as they co-created. So we want to get that wake, awakened in people first. And this is a big challenge because people on earth are not taught any of this at all growing up. Gurus on earth, as far as I know, don't teach this. They don't know about the hue, which will take people beyond the void. It's designed to do that. Om will not do it. That goes to the mental plane only. You have to go higher. So there are sounds that are connected to the various planes. In the physical, which you know about when we go out in space outside of Earth, there is an omnipresent power out there supporting physical matter, galaxies and planets and all of that. And it has a certain sound, a universal sound, that sounds like kind of a soft rumbling thunder like a hum or a little more rumble to it. No lightning. It's not frightening. And it makes this sound on different frequency levels in the parallel dimensions of the physical universe. When you go into the next heaven, so to speak, which is not heaven, by the way, you go into the astral plane, you have a body you're running there. Whether you know it or not, or forgotten it. And so that body has a, is a molecular structure to it. Uh, it. It would look human, maybe an alien from another planet, depending on where you are. But lives are much longer there. The abilities are greater. If you've ever had a dream of flying around in a physical body, that's where you were doing it. But it is not the end of the road and it is not heaven. It has many problems like problems on earth. You go up to the causal plane. Now, by the way, and in the astral plane, all matter, all things are moved through emotion. So all emotion comes from that dimension. It's passed down through the pineal gland into your body on Earth. All your emotion comes from a higher self. When you go up into the causal plane, everything's moved by cause and effect instantly. In the mental plane, it's by thought. In the etheric plane, it's through, it's considered the subconscious plane, but it isn't unconscious. It's a, it's a place where people can jump across the void and go back to the higher worlds. The problem with the etheric plane is most people get stuck there. They live for millions of years in a transparent human-like body and they never want to leave. But that's not the end of the road. It's still part of the lower planes of time and space. And you all have a body in each one of those places. Five, physical, astral, causal, mental, and etheric. And the Atma, you, which you're aware of here on Earth, is what's running all those bodies on each plane. And the purpose for that is so we can become master of all, respecters of all life in the grand multidimensional creation, which is our purpose for existing, our destiny to become co-creators with the source itself, not worshipers of it. That's like worshiping yourself, it's vanity. If you worship a supreme being, 
you're part of that supreme being made of the same energy in a smaller scale like a drop out of an ocean of the same energy and to worship that is to worship yourself it's self-defeating ultimately it doesn't work respecting a supreme being is one thing worshiping it is quite different so when we learn to respect life which is what divine love is then everything starts to come into perspective for us the master teachers I work with and that I've known all my life will not tolerate, will do not put up with people worshiping them or putting them on a pedestal. The only thing they require is knowing them and being respectful of them. They respect us and our potential because we're the same as them. We're Atmas. If you were to go to try to worship Sat Nam above the void, as a god, because that might be the real first god you might ever meet, but doesn't consider himself in that light. A master teacher, yes. The governor or ruler, per, per se, of that plane, yes. But there are many beings above him. So people don't even know about these higher realities. They, they don't remember. The only way to recover memory of that, when you have never had it taught to you on a planet where you're born, is to go out and explore it and bring back the awareness to the body because you will not find it on earth being taught anywhere not in a school not in a university not in a religion not politically earth should be a different world than it is it's destined to be one but it's going to take a certain percentage of people on this planet first in order to transform it that is underway so that means you're all part of this transformation because you're aware of it that means the omnipresent power, the hue itself, moves through us now, through the consciousness we have. And it will continue to work to protect and guide us while it's moving through us to be a benefit to others. This is the way it really works. In a way, we earn our way back into freedom, back into remembering who and what we are that has the capability to understand the different levels of creation and all the life on all the worlds. The Atma, each one of us, has this capability built into it. You can't become that in the distant future. You can't evolve into that Atma, that spherical energy. You already are it. Waking up those faculties, waking up the, the fact that we're already perfect and that all negative things are external to us, outside and the energy that surrounds us, this really makes a big difference in a person's life. Because it begins to give them true free will, begins to recover their ability to make better decisions. For me, I don't trust my own decisions all the time down here on earth. So I rely on Sat Nam to help make me make better decisions because he's not living in the lower worlds of time and space and has no negative nature. This is what I've chosen to do because of my relationship with him. It's a co-creative one. He's far more advanced than I am and runs a dimension above the void. But we respect each other. I see him for what he is. I befriended him when I first met him. I didn't put him on a pedestal and worship him. If I had, he would have walked away from me because he would have said, you're not ready. If you gather my meaning, then you'll understand what I'm saying. If you really respect all life, not just life on earth, these beings will work with you. Otherwise, they'll step aside until you're ready. And this is the way they are. We respect them and move ahead with them or they just walk away from us until we're ready. They don't have time to waste and they don't play games. They aren't entertained by the things people think are important on earth at all. They're only interested in one thing, your sincere desire to return home. In a sense, upload into that source all you've learned in all of your lives so you can fulfill your creative destiny. And that is to be a trustworthy, conscious co-creator with the source behind all life itself. There's only one way to do that. And that's to know it and respect it by direct experience. 
you have to have a proper guide. And I have many beings, masterful beings, that work with me in trust. To get you above the void, Satnam is one, of course. Torellian is another. Master teachers are also others. Beings further above Satnam are also involved in this work, like Agam Purusha, the top silent mentor himself. These are beings I befriended on my return journey there. So I go back to the source all the time, and I'm running a body on earth. And if I can do it, you can too. When you imagine someone you respect and love, you're grateful they are in your life. It can be a person, place, or thing, but just make sure that it's something that makes you smile inside. It could be a beautiful bird or a kid's smile or, you know, waterfall or a pretty flower or just having a, a nice scent on the air or whatever. Some master you respect that makes you smile, whatever it is. Because that is respect for source itself. And it picks up on this. You may not know this now. But when you start thinking in the right way and asking the right questions, which most people on earth never do, they're always asking for things or asking for this, material this or material that. And there's nothing wrong with it except they're not asking the right questions in order to become awake and aware as a enlightened being. There's one thing people have to become aware of to become what we call enlightened. The first sound behind all creation. Because it only works one way. It cannot be tampered with. It cannot be controlled. It cannot be manipulated. It cannot be patented. It cannot be in any way grasped in your hands. And that is the omnipresent hue itself. The first sound behind creation because it comes from the source, many planes above Satnam's realm. And it flows in great volume through this being we call Satnam. Sat means true, Nam means name, true name, first representation of these higher beings above the void. Remember this, we came from above the void before we got lost in these worlds and forgot everything. By the time you get born on earth with no memory at all or very little, you're about as far down as you can get. And there's only one way left to go from there, and that's onward and upward, which is why I always say that in my communications with people. Onward and upward. It's nice to know that the only way we have to go from where we are on earth is upward. That's a good direction. When we contact the hue, you comes from the first half of the word human. Languages on earth did not originate here. They were changed over time, but they didn't begin on this planet. Human beings were never evolved on earth to begin with. Had oceans, dinosaurs are made extinct, and then life was brought here. It did not evolve from dinosaurs or amoebas from the ocean or from sea life or birds. Most of those creatures were bought here as well from other worlds. So human beings, the body forms we have represented by different races, never evolved on this planet. It's important for you to understand, to remember that all these races represented on Earth came from different world systems out in our galaxy, even from other galaxies that have binary or trinary star systems around which their worlds revolve, which is where real evolution takes place as far as developing body forms to a higher form like the Say rays did so many, several billions of years ago to raise the genetic structure of bodies that Atlas could run, and it was intended they could run them by passing higher faculties of co-creation through those bodies. It was never intended that people become unconscious, wondering if they're a body or they're something called soul, they don't know what it is or where it is. That was never the original intent. But that's what happened. When you create something new like the lower worlds of time and space, so many billions of years ago. 
and then beans get sent down into it. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And over billions of years, a great many beings that used to live free in the upper worlds were stuck here, running a body, wondering how they got here, what they, why they don't remember anything. So, first thing we do, the first thing that is my responsibility to do is to send out the hue with these beings who are going to go on the journey. They're going to go on the journey with us. They escort, they protect, they guide, they teach by direct example. You Torelli and the others who we meet on these journeys do this with me. They are, of course, out in space. They are not on Earth. They do not have bodies on planet Earth. They are not trapped in bodies or think they're bodies on planet Earth. So these are the beings we work with to help us recover this awareness. They know us as Atmas, running bodies who have forgotten all this. Of course, they know that. And they see the problems have people have on Earth unwrapping these tight knots of fear, subconscious fear, not conscious so much. And influences people's decisions. Some people can step forward. Some people step forward a little, back off and go away for a while. And they come back stronger, ready to go forward. Perry and I, or anybody I work with, do not determine or uh, control anybody's free will or decision making in this way. That we do not do. None of them. They can provide an example of freedom. They can provide an example of how to travel among the stars and take us on journeys. But they can't make us drink when we're thirsty. We have to choose to do that. That's what they respect when a person steps forward and shows the hue they're ready to return home. The hue starts training them differently from that point onward in their life. And otherwise, it's just been supporting whatever you've done life after life, unconscious and in bodies and forgetting everything. It supports everything, good and bad. But there is an element moving through the omnipresent power that is new, that comes from the upper realities where we're headed, that is being implemented through the lower worlds of time and space by Satnam and incredibly wondrous beings, including the silent mentors who run the mechanics of creation. And it's moving in one direction only, 
It has mastery over positive and negative, good and bad. And when it passes through us, when it starts moving, it starts harmonizing negative and positive into a harmonious force where the two energies revolve around each other. And then things are manifested without creating opposites. Cause and effect. Negative repercussions in time space. What we put out in the physical universe, astral and the lower planes, comes back to us. It's one of the principal laws of the lower worlds of time and space. So if we're putting out fear of the present and future and good things for our family and friends, you're putting out two things that are opposing forces and the hue will manifest both of them as a teacher. That's the way it was originally set up, but that experiment failed. The experiment of good and evil failed because it was meant to cattle prod people, bring their feet close to the fires of hell and get them learning spiritual logic quickly. The attractions to bodies and pleasures and things are so great in the lower worlds, people just get lost in it. After enough time, they forget everything before they're even grabbed and implanted and stuffed in a body on earth. So when we go on the journeys, we're recovering several things. Getting mastery over implantation and beings that do such things in our own individual world and having the trust to surrender to the omnipresent power itself, which is changing, to help us recover all we were made to forget one way or another, we become, along the way, co-creatively involved in the solution and not in creating continuous problems. It is a fact that people on Earth the way they are will annihilate all life on this planet. There's no doubt whatsoever in that outcome, left to their own devices as they have been. So to change that direction, the greater God, the greater beings that have never stepped foot on earth, mostly have to have a focus to want to deal with this planet and its people. And they didn't have that focus before. Life on earth has come, great civilizations have been built here and destroyed overnight. This whole thing about dying and going to heaven is not new. People have been doing that for ages and still coming back here. So they don't realize there isn't any savior or anybody that can come here and wave a magic wand and set someone free while they do nothing to recover themselves along the way because such immature beings would go up into the higher heavens and destroy everything with their childish, immature, irresponsible, and untrained behavior. So they aren't allowed to return to source with any negative nature. In fact, we can't even take anything of any negative nature with us into the void at all. That's, it's a barrier, it doesn't allow it. So we have to leave the bodies asleep and safe in the trance state we call sleep on all the planes where we're running one and then go back to source as the app with the pure energy that we are because it has no negative nature. You don't have to get rid of negative nature in the future. You have to let go of a habit of binding yourself to it. Imagining negative things is a bad habit. That in itself is a bad habit, but having subconscious influences implanted that propel you to be like that, that's worse. So we do this process of getting secondary implants gone. Actually, I don't remove them, as you all know. And then we go into the primary implant a little more subtly because people really have to be ready to look into that one. And even then, it's just another step along the way. When you look into the primary implant and find out how you were killed, I mean, not pleasantly, and stuffed in a body on Earth with no memory, then it becomes just a memory. It's no longer subconscious. It can't influence you anymore. You become more masterful. Even if the implant's still there, it won't matter because you know what's in it. So that's the real value of this work. Beyond those things comes the journeys, way out into the atmosphere, out into space, other worlds, other dimensions, higher realities, where we can gain back direct experience without negative influence whatsoever. 
And we leave that behind with the sleeping body on earth. A man and a woman assigned to you for all these journeys from the Galactic Alliance, but not only from the Galactic Alliance, it's also master teachers that are beyond that or aren't part of the Galactic Alliance for this galaxy also go with us on these journeys. Some of them come down here from the mental plane. Or even further, like Lai Tzu, this ancient Chinese sage who works in the etheric plane and is stationed as one of the first people to work in the Hue Expansion Ray Academy above Satnam's realm. He doesn't have lower bodies below the etheric. He had one on Earth in ancient China, but not now. Beings like this go on these journeys with us. There are people you once knew long ago and long forgot. Probably even one of your teachers in the past. Or Buddha or any of these people could have been one of your teachers. But the most pro profound teachers you've ever had didn't exist on Earth and have never been here. There are other worlds where you've lived most of your lives before you started incarnating on Earth with little or no former memory intact. The ability to see into the multidimensional universe is a natural function of each Atma. In those teardrops and those layers is all the wisdom you could ever need to circumnavigate the entire multidimensional creation. Transform bodies, do this, do that. There's a wisdom that has to go with the awakening of these abilities, the recovery of them, so that you don't demonstrate such abilities inappropriately in front of people who react with fear and probably kill you, even governments, if you do this the wrong way at the wrong time. So the wisdom to wield higher faculties must be there in place before they're recovered in you or they would destroy you again. We don't want that. The beings I work with do not want that. They want to give you gifts to help you over the rough hurdles after you put in some effort. They will do so by their own free will. They know who's worthy. They know who would keep it if it was given to them, and they know who will not. They cannot be fooled. They cannot be lied to. They cannot be misdirected or controlled by anybody on earth period. Quite impossible. When people on earth discover they need to respect life out in the universe, the greater God, then they'll be given the opportunity to enjoy it. Not before that. Otherwise, some master gives you a gift of enlightenment and you just go destroy yourself with it the next day. What good is that? No good. So the hue what we call the Hue Expansion Ray that's moving through the universe, is now imparting a certain kind of wisdom that it never did before. When we go on these journeys, we're plugged into it. And it rubs off on us as it passes through us. It knows what it's doing. It, the primary source behind all life, is not a man or a woman or a body at all. It doesn't sit on the throne. And we're going to go visit that. So we get more familiar with what reality is really like, not what you're taught on Earth incorrectly. Because there's nothing on Earth that really teaches this yet. It should be here. It should be from the time you're born, you should know how to do this. On normal worlds in our galaxy, entire populations know this stuff. They travel in ships between worlds and dimensions within the physical universe. They get around, and it's ancient technology. It's not new at all. Imagine being near the ceiling. You are a spherical being. This is just daydreaming. You do it all the time. It's easy. So when you look down on your body, you realize when you look left and right, there's a man and woman hovering there beside you. An atma looks just like you, a little brighter maybe. They weren't born on Earth. They don't have bodies on Earth that are having problems. And you realize they're showing you a body form that's perfect. I mean, beautiful, handsome, male and female, about 36. And you're showing them the same thing because they have turned off your secondary, if you have them, and primary implants. It's their job. It's their service. It's easy for them. 
My job is to help you see and understand and perceive this through your ability to daydream or to not imagine, but look into the universe and see stuff. The way we look into the universe to see things is with the perceptions of the atma, which are not limited to the limits of physical eyes and human bodies on earth. It can only see a very small spectrum of light. The atma is not so limited at all. It can see the light and sound and all the planes and all the planets and all the dimensions and all the doorways and Satnam and all the other worlds. It has the ability to do this. Human brains on earth and bodies do not. So to make human bodies and personalities and brains on earth more enlightened, they have to go through some energy changes of a sort. They've got to bring enlightenment back to them. You can't ascend into the higher worlds without first bringing enlightenment to yourself here. It doesn't just get dumped on your head. We have to explain if that happened, people would just destroy themselves with it. Fear would creep into that ability, those higher powers, and they would destroy themselves and others. We've all done it. So this work is not about going back to old territory. This work has a certain protection with it. It comes with a certain guidance that prevents us from doing that again. This is the advantage of it. And this is what's changing. So you have the ability to show other beings this perfect female, in your case, women, five of you, a perfect female body, about 36, beautiful, flawless. It is not a DNA body, it is not molecules or atoms, but it looks human. It's the prototype you use to connect to bodies unconsciously on planets like Earth. But we don't, if your person is not awake, the being, they don't create the same form on the planets they go to because they can't access that ability. They're not aware of it. So we wanna make this ability aware in people too. It's not lost or destroyed. It's been suppressed. And fear is the only thing in the way of waking that up. Nothing else. The only thing we ever have to give up in life, ultimately, is fear. Permanently. Who wouldn't want to be free of that permanently? When a person's rational and brought out of their insanity on earth, which they are, then they know this to be true for themselves because they've it's always been in them anyway. Then you find yourself at 10,000 meters in the atmosphere above where you live, wherever it is on Earth. And you begin to hear a sound, and it sounds like gentle rumbling thunder, kind of a deep humming sound. It's not frightening. It's in the atmosphere at 10,000 meters behind the oxygen molecules. And as an atma, the physical looking form, and you as the atma, can see and perceive this stuff. The eyes and ears and all those perceptive mechanisms in the perfect form you show people sees all the same things that the atma sees. The mistake people make is thinking that they're able to see this through the physical eyes and the body they have on earth. This is not true. You could have your eyes open sitting in a restaurant and see the hue and hear the sound. And you'd think your physical eyes and brain and ears are hearing it, but this is also not true. The atma hovering above the body that you are is what's hearing that. And it's on that energy that we travel. So this man and woman beside you point upward. And we find ourselves in space, standing in a circle of beings around Ambassador Torellian of the Say Ray's Race. 18 feet tall guy, you can't miss him. This is not a physical body he's showing you, but it looks like one. Much more vibrant and alive. Has a light around it. A Caucasian kind of skin, but he's not Caucasian from Earth. Kind of an ivory skin, big blue eyes, slightly bigger than Earth humans. Blonde hair down to his shoulders. Simple gown, bare feet, standing there with his closed fists with thumbs up. What he's doing is bringing a higher form of the hue. Well, actually, he's not bringing it. Satnam is channeling it. And it comes through him. 
And then he creates a field of energy, like an oval, transparent, golden white light, like a spaceship around us. It's brighter than the hue in space we see out here, because out here, it's everything's a white golden light. It is not planets, the moon, or the sun, or the stars. Those things float in this other energy. That void of space we see is not a void. It is one living power. It is the power we all are and have always been. You cannot become this power in the future. You were all always that in the ancient past, far beyond your comprehension of how far back that past is hundreds of billions of Earth years. We've been around a long time. You start running a human body, the Atlas, pretty ancient. Whether it's unaware of it or not on Earth is another matter. But out here in space, around Torellian, truth cannot elude you. It cannot evade you. You're plugged into the one energy that comes from the higher realities here. And so you have access to a wisdom you normally would not have on your own. This is what we do. We plug ourselves into this one power. We're also made of the same power. And we do that. We have wisdom you cannot learn in 10 lifetimes on Earth. You just know. There are master teachers here. Ramu towards Earth, standing there just like we are with his maroon collared robe and his short cropped black curly hair and beard, simple sandals, rope for a belt, holding that staff of his, his symbol. Golden quartz glowing staff of the Ankh, the ancient symbol from ancient, ancient Egypt for eternal life, which did not originate in Egypt either, by the way. It was brought there. You want to go back in history and really know it, then you have to understand that you were part of the ancient history, not only of Earth, but of the solar system, and on many other worlds, and many other galaxies, and many other dimensions. This is your background. It can't be learned in the future. You've already lived it. But the points that make you wiser, the lives that can make you smarter on Earth, are the ones we seek to recall. The rest don't matter. We're looking at wisdom here added into our life on Earth, a wisdom you never learned on Earth in the first place. Master Opelum, with his blue skin and long jet black hair and emerald green eyes, is standing on the opposite side of Torellian, further out in space. Et and Din, the Drens, are hovering above. Ambassador Trillian and Satnam is way up high in space. And above him is this hourglass shaped golden whirling vortex. And it's a doorway that bypasses all the lower worlds of time and space. Because our goal is to visit other planets, special planets, yes. But our goal is to go up to where the void is and go through it with our guide Satnam. And Torellian is a focal point to keep us focused. And we go on up there. And we come and arrive on the shore of Satnam's land. The first realm above the void, beyond it. There are many so-called heavens above the void. And people on Earth have forgotten all about that stuff. And they shouldn't. To recover who we are, we have to return to the source. The system has been in place since the beginning. When the hue crosses your path, it means you have done something right. It means you have done something to step forward in a way that your fellows are not yet ready to do. Fellow women, fellow men, children, plants, animals, you name it. And so it begins to connect with you in a different way. It recognizes that you have the potential to return home after billions of years of being lost and wandering, not remembering much of anything that really matters. And then it becomes to be a, a kind of a 
what you call the people call divine spirit a kind of guide it's not of negative nature There are 12 ships stationed in a circle around a circle of energy Ambassador Trillin has created. There are guides, men and women, from the Galactic Alliance in this case, stationed beside each one of you, simply standing beside you as friends. They see your potential. You need to respectfully recognize theirs because it's awakened them fully. They do not have the fear they've had to deal with like people on earth. They didn't grow up with subconscious minds. They don't have subconscious fear. They are normal. People on earth as atmas are, but the bodies they're running and the link they have to them is not normal. That's completely wrong. Earth is not a normal planet of human beings. Not yet. Everybody knows it. We're all smart, really. If you put negative things aside, your intelligence goes way up. IQ just expands exponentially. And we have the ability to understand things we didn't dream we could understand five years ago or during most of our life because it's never been lost or destroyed, just subconsciously suppressed. The same being, man and woman, about 36, <clears throat> Chantel and Tonaltiel, <clears throat> Don Tam and Lam Tam go with us. In this case, they'll be stationed around myself and Perry, but their associates just as experienced from the Galactic Alliance are stationed around each one of you. And if you have the courage, you can ask their names. And if you're not too frightened and not in fear, you'll be able to hear them. But you'll be able to call on them after the journey. When you go to sleep at night, put the body to sleep. You'll be able to do this. And they can help you every night. They are not interested in the things people find of value on Earth. They do not deal with money. They don't have politics like on Earth or religions like on Earth. They know the source omnipresent living power itself. That's how they move around the stars so easily. They know how to work with it. And if you don't work with zero point or toroidal energy, the energy of the universe, you will never travel faster than light or go anywhere, ever. It was set up as a fail safe this way. If we want to advance and wake up, we got to play ball with a greater power. And most of that God is not on this earth and never was. It's out there among the stars and up and through the all the dimensions all the way back to source. Torellian is now moving upward. There are other master teachers here. Light sees up besides Edda and Din. Satnam is already here. This is a guy that runs the entire first reality above the void. Why does he take a personal interest in us? Well, who knows, but he does. Maybe it's because I befriended him. I didn't worship him. I respected him. I was able to walk with him side by side and experience the wisdom of this being. I didn't put him on a pedestal. That didn't mean I didn't respect him and did not, and it didn't mean that I didn't understand how much more evolved he was than me. That's given. But the respect is mutual. I trust him. Trust doesn't come easy in people on Earth. Too much fear. So we're moving up as this oval sphere of brighter golden white light, like a spaceship, right up into that void, following Satnam, who's simply receding up into it. Remember, he's showing you a physical body. A physical looking body, but it isn't. It's a projection from the Atma, which is much bigger than ours, and many more layers to it hovering above the form. And the form has this little white tunic dress on from his waist to his bare ankles. 
his bronze colored skin, bald head, golden eyes, not yellow, two gold bracelets on his upper arms, bare chested, strong, ripped, muscular, 36-ish, just like we are. But he is ancient. He was there before the lower worlds of time and space were built. Well, guess what? So were you. How old are you? Well, you can't determine that compared to a body on Earth. A hundred years gets nothing. It's a blink. You've had lifetimes live 10,000, 20,000, even 50,000 years. Out in history, the galactic history you were part of. Just because you don't remember doesn't mean you didn't do it. There's wisdom that goes with such lifetimes. If they can be recovered while you're on Earth and brought back to Earth, it's going to raise your intelligence a great deal. So we're moving up right into the vortex, right into the middle of this hourglass-shaped whirling golden white light, whirling clockwise. There's a blue-green luminous vibrant energy whirling around the outside of it. What it's done... When I sent out the hues with these beings, we created a vortex through all the dimensions. That's what each tone represents. So that we can connect a doorway to get up to the void. Now up at the other end of this vortex, you hear this sound humming around you. You see levels of galaxies passing outside through the transparent luminous nature of the light that's whirling around us. We're moving up through dimensions, levels of heavens. And on the other end, you see this pale blue atmosphere everywhere. We're suddenly in it. And out in it, there's Satnam still receding further upward. And we're still following him as a guide. We actually are surrounded by a higher form of the hue that comes from Satnam's realm and higher. So this is what we plug into to go on these journeys. Not the hue in space. There's nothing wrong with it. It's pure. But it doesn't have the same conscious energy that the energy around us has when we go on these journeys. The hue is driving us upward. It is the manifesting power from source that manifests where we see we want to go. An individual atma does not have the power in itself to manifest what it sees and imagines. The one power it floats in, just like a planet floats in it. Each atma floats in it. And when we put something properly out into it, it manifests one power, which will always be the one power. The living force behind creation manifests what we see, what we imagine. When we start getting free of negative and positive and fear of the present and future, we start imagining only benevolent, benevolent, uplifting things for our good and for the good of all life. This is what wakes up in a person that goes back to the Hugh Expansion Ray Academy and higher. Can't help it. And as we're moving up into this void, this vortex, where you can look right down through it and see us still hovering around Torellian by Earth and the barren moon. There's a white golden light around everything that's in space. It's not black because you're that way. You can see that. And then it vanishes. And everywhere you look in every direction is just this pale blue light. So some beings who've made it this far call it the void. They think it's the realm of the supreme being. It's not. It is pure hue, and it's a much higher form of the hue than in space around Earth. But it is a barrier. You cannot bring, none of you can bring any negative nature with you here. That's left turned off by this man and woman assigned to you, back with your sleeping body on Earth, because your bodies are in the trance state called sleep. You put it there every night, easily, like masters. Being aware of what you do when you're out of your body is where enlightenment comes into the picture. So we're moving ever upward in this incredible speed up through this vast void of pale cobalt blue kind of light. 
And on the other end of it, you can begin to see a white speck, and you can see Satnam disappear upward. And then as we approach where he went, we begin to see this white sandy beach glowing. And as we approach, it's extended as far as you can see in this infinite pale blue void. It curves at the ends as far as you can see. So it tells you it is surrounding a circular landmass. As we approach this luminous beach and stand on it in our bare feet, the Atma hovering above the perfect form you're showing each other here, Torellian standing offshore as if he's standing in ocean water. He's standing in this pale blue light. He loves to put it, stand it up to his knees. It's kind of an illusion, really. It's not water. He's just standing in the omnipresent hue that makes up the void at the other end of it. And you look down and you realize this glowing sand, when you pick it up in a hand, is little round diamond polished clear crystals radiating light. And they have a certain amount of wisdom in each one. And they go into your hand, made of energy, up through the top of your head. You look up smiling. goes into the white core of your being, the atma, the spherical you. And then it does something to those teardrops. So whatever it's doing, consider it a gift from Satnam himself. And the development of those and turning on of those things are really up to them. Because if we had our own way on earth, we would screw things up using power that we don't have the wisdom awakened to use properly. And these beings don't mess around. They want us to gain things permanently. That's what master teachers really do. Get us to recover enough personal responsibility to realize we are co-creators with source. And if we want to get rid of the old failed experiment of good and evil, we have to do our part as beings who come from the source who created it in the first place, which we all did. So one of the other things people on earth, they get grounded in religions because they're afraid to remember their responsibility to source itself, prime creator. It's a it, perfect freedom comes with perfect responsibility. The two are married. So we cannot wield higher faculties blindly or ignorantly. We have to be able to be trusted with them. So that's what this training is about. Being trusted with who and what we are, with the source itself. The Satnam lifts up above these trees. You look at this jungle, and these jungle trees are all transparent. There's energy, beautiful rainbow color energy, running up the trunks of these trees. There are birds flooding around. They meet us. Hundreds of them. And they line up in rows above the trees. They look like blue jays with long V-shaped split tails and rainbow feather colored bodies with big blue eyes. Twin sets of bird wings hovering in space. Now these are very high energy forms or bodies, much more evolved than human. And yet they are not human. They have vocal cords and photographic memories just like you do when it's awakened. And they're singing the hue with perfect male and female voices. It blends into one sound to greet us. And then they disperse into the trees. And we move over the top of the trees. We are literally levitating the atma and the body that is not matter, that looks like you, but perfect, is moving over the top of these trees. In the distance, you can see a diagonal mountain range blue stone with snow covering it. And along the base of this mountain range, several miles in the distance, is this these palatial crystalline transparent estate buildings. Big blue lapis lazuli gold laced stones like Greek pillars. The top of a foot thick golden steps that go up hundreds of steps. And then it comes into a triangular opening in this biggest mountain back there. And it goes up some steps to this blue throne-like chair. And the blue throne-like chair is smooth, polished edges, like a piece of blue quartz. And it's glowing. 
Now this is where Satnam could sit, but as you can see, he's just traveling with us, beside us. I've never seen him sit in that chair, like some ruler or dictator. Somebody wants to come up this far and put him on a pedestal, they'll see him in the throne chair. But they won't gain any much experience doing that. They'll be too busy worshiping something instead of respecting it. There is a big difference. So we're moving past that throne chair going, and there's a big cold curved dome inside. There's blue stone walls. And down to the left, there's a corridor. It's maybe 10 feet wide. And on the left side of it, you can see what looks like an LCD screen, 20, 30 feet long, a dozen feet high. And in it, you can see all the different levels of the lower worlds of time and space, including the void. When Satnam tests something that's been developed in the U Expansion Ray Academy, where we're going, he tests it through this interdimensional connection point. And then if it comes back true, necessary, and kind to where he is above the void, then everybody gets excited in the upper worlds and they implement it and change things. Something like that has not happened in the lower worlds of time and space for billions of years. This has changed permanently changed. When we go through a triangular opening, we come out into a, oh, it's just a beautiful concentric circles of flowering four foot high plants all the way up to the base of the mountains and waterfalls cascading down the mountainsides of luminous blue green water flowing around this fountain like a circular pond. The sound coming from this big fountain, it has Gold, it has white, kind of blue stone, white, hard to describe, scalloped edges like the fountain out beyond the Palatial Estate that we've visited before. This is much bigger. And there's a luminous blue green water with a golden element in the middle of it flowing up and down. In other words, what's filling this fountain is coming from a shaft of white, golden light. And it's pouring over the edges in a glistening luminous sheet. And it sounds like the very high, pure, harmonious notes of flutes. Now this comes from source itself. It is a power station. Supplies the power from Agam Purusha, many planes above, to support the Atma realm, Satnam's realm. The realm of the Atma, the first place where we embarked on journeys in the lower worlds of time and space, began here, but it's not where we originated. So we're going up into this fountain, this golden oval light that contains all of us that Torellians manifested, and Satnam remains here, watching us, hovering beside the fountain, pointing upward. And we go up into it and we're suddenly coming out the other end and into a parallel dimension that was specially created between the top of Satnam's realm and the beginning of what's called the sixth realm above the void. There are many more realms above the sixth realm. And we get to Agam Purusha's realm, who manages the raw power of eternity himself, a single being. And then we go up into the ocean of sound and light, prime creator, source. What Perry mentioned earlier about going the next realm would be the realm of the silent mentors, the mechanics of creation that hold it all in place. The one above that, which was brought into creation fairly recently, is called the U Expansion Ray Plane. And this is run by silent mentors. I'm stationed there. It's a responsibility. It's not about ego. You can't bring ego with you into the void, much less into this realm. That all stays with lower bodies in time and space comfortably asleep. It is only us that are here now, the true us. No negative nature, no fear. And we're moving up into this fountain of light until we come out the other end into a cobalt blue atmosphere so brilliant it makes you squint at first until your physical looking body eyes adjust to it. The atma has no problem with it. 
And in the distance, you can see a floating mound nest. It's much bigger than Sot Mound's realm, actually. And a little bigger. It has another white sandy beach around it. It's a floating landmass in the center of an infinite cobalt blue luminous light surrounding it. The sound is indescribable, coming from the center of the tower in the middle of six snow-covered mountain peaks that are in the center of this huge landmass. And we're moving over the top of this towards the six mountain peaks. When we come over the top of the six mountain peaks, you can look now over and out to the entire landmass, and it's very vast. And you can see that there are little tunnels, like horseshoe-shaped, U-shaped tunnels, cut perfectly out of blue stone, glowing with golden light, cut in the base of these mountains. And they come out to, to step onto white stone roadways, like the spokes of a bicycle's tire that go out to the beach, out to the ocean, every direction around this landmass. Each one of these roads has a teaching facility. To the right, another one a little further to the left, then to the right, all the way to the ocean that surrounds this plate, which is, of course, made of the pure hue. It is a cobalt blue energy, but you can see the golden white light of eternity behind it, supporting it. You look down on this in between the basin of these six mountains. You can see a white island surrounded by a blue-green luminous lake, a circular lake. And out of the edges of this white island is a blue glass-like tower, transparent. It's smooth as glass. It's very tall. It comes up to an oval flattened administration area, two-thirds the way up this tower, even about the height of the mountain peaks. And then it goes up to a minaret point, and there's a golden white shaft of light coming down into this tower. It's a device. It's a doorway. And in the middle of the bottom, sitting in the middle of that, oh, like a white round beach that this tower comes out of, is a four-foot-tall perpendicular, standing upright, four feet high, two feet thick, blue stone laced with gold, with curved edges. Hovering above it is a four foot in diameter class like sphere, like the tower. But in the middle of it is this brilliant, brighter cobalt blue star glowing in the middle of this container. And this shaft of light is coming down into it. It goes down the base of this tower and into the hollowed out interior of the entire Hue Expansion Ray Academy. There are two places, or actually three, where we can meet with silent mentors, the creator, the mechanics of creation. One is inside the interior of this floating landmass. One is out in four quadrants, two thirds of the way down a roadway in the middle of each one. To the right in each one is a clearing. There's 12 different kinds of trees in each one. And there are beings who stand up above these treetops in human-like form. You can see them from here. Twelve of them, alternating male and female, long hair to their shoulders, a different colored gown, meaning they have a different function. Above them is a four foot, it's four times bigger in diameter than what we are as an Adma. Hovering above the body forms they're showing us. The faces, you, can, you cannot see any detail because these are not human bodies. They just look human. When you look in the face, you see levels upon levels upon levels of galaxies because that's how they think. They can be stationed here and be anywhere else in creation instantly from the lowest planet to the highest heaven in any form and to carry out a mission. And you would never even, never even know they're there. And they are stationed in these four quadrants, out circling the outside in the cobalt blue light, surrounding the outside of this beach that surrounds this floating hue expansion ray academy. Are these clear domes covering most of a little round island? 
and in it are three golden-sided quartz-capped pyramids. And there is a being hovering above each dome, another silent mentor, alternating male and female, no trees, and this bigger atma hovering above them. So they are now part of the teaching faculty of the Hugh Expansion Ray Academy. Masters like Ramu and Opelum and Etta and Din and Light C and Torellian and Satnam, who's just, you know, a massive, wondrous being. They have a presence here. This is a place where we can come and do some co-creating with others. We are Atmas just like them. Without fear or negative nature, why not? We have to start somewhere. When we move away from the mountains, you begin to see down each one of you in a circle around Torellian are going to notice a location somewhere on this massive circular landmass down one of the roadways. And there's a clearing. And in it is a clear dome like glass. And there's a golden sphere of light about four feet across hovering near two thirds of the way up inside it. The stone floors are like white and some blue stone mixed around the walls. Now, these are individual co-creation domes. There's no limit to space because there's no time and space here. No molecules, no atoms, no bodies, no protons, no nucleus, no DNA. No electrons, none of that. That's all lower world stuff. Now these golden spheres of light contain a certain charge of energy from source itself. Some of you have been to your own dome before. If you haven't, you're going to notice. And this is up to you. You're just going to be drawn to wherever this is for you. And then you're going to find yourself inside it. And you appear like as a sphere, like a maybe a dime to a dinner plate. It's a big dome. And you still have this physical appearing form that looks human that you're running as an atmos, a spherical being. And you move up inside this golden light right through it. It's transparent. You move right through it. And you're hovering up inside this golden co-creation sphere. And then a master teacher or two comes in and joins you. Torelli could step in. I could step in. Uh, Ramu or Pelham or Atta and Din. Lightsey or hundreds of other teachers that are here. Male and female. Timeless. The Atmos hovering above their forms. And they're eager to add their genius and their wisdom and their co-creative mastery to whatever you imagine here. Remember, the only thing you could imagine here has no negative nature. So it's going to be something that springs from you that's beneficial to all life, not just life on Earth. The whole multidimensional creation for the benefit of all life. You cannot create here unless it's created that way. That's the purpose of the Hugh Expansion Ray Academy. It was brought into creation by master teachers and silent mentors a little over 10 or 11 Earth years ago. It did not exist up here before. This is the one place where we can meet with silent mentors because they have not in the past, in hundreds of billions of years, had any direct dealings with most of what we call an atma like us. That was not their job. They didn't function like master teachers to have kindness or care about you or anything else. They're too busy keeping the whole creation in place. Galaxies turning on their axis. Moons revolving around planets. Planets around suns. Stars around other stars. Worlds without end. You think the physical universe is vast with billions of galaxies. There are levels to that before you even get to the astral plane. Up here, you could fit the whole lower worlds of time and space into a part of the Atma plane where Satnam dwells. 
He does not like what people think because they have been made to forget this higher reality stuff a long time ago. The sound here is indescribable. We're going out to the northern end of this Hue Expansion Ray Academy as a group of beings still focused around Torellian. I'm standing beside him, Perry's on the other side. The master teachers in the circle, the man and woman beside you are all still there and several hundred other master teachers. We're going offshore to the northern part of this facility and out to the one dome of 12. And we're going inside this clear dome covering three golden-sided quartz-capped pyramids, four-sided pyramids. And down in the middle of them is a fountain. And it's a brilliant blue stone type fountain, scalloped edges. It has blue-green water like light flowing up from the fountain, connecting to a golden white light. It's charging it, and then it's falling back down around the edges of the fountain. And standing above this, in the beam itself, is a male being, a blue robe. He has pale blue skin, long emerald green hair to his shoulders. Can't see any facial features, just the white light. You see galaxies upon galaxies in that. And above him, four foot larger than we are, four foot in diameter. I mean, four times bigger is the being. This is a silent mentor. Happens to be the top silent mentor. I do not utter his name. It's something each individual can find out on their own. They have the courage. Now, this being is simply demonstrating for all of you how they are. He doesn't utter words. He doesn't have a blackboard or computer. You're going to realize that we are standing in a circle around Torellian. And this oval light disappears from around us. We're now standing in a circle around this fountain. And there's this being hovering up there. Torellian is off to the right beside him. I'm off to the left. There's a circle of master teachers around us up there. And they're moving energy through. The energy is coming through this silent mentor. Through us. Into Torellian. Down into the fountain and back. Moving through us. So in this way, they begin to share with us what they are like. This is the one place in the whole multiverse where you can meet with and have some rub shoulders with silent mentors. They run the mechanics of the entire creation. They still don't have anything to do with individual training of Atlas. But here, we begin to learn about them. We begin to appreciate and respect them. They begin to appreciate and respect more what master teachers are because here, we mix it up. So there's a quality of being, being grown or advanced within certain atmas that is a blending of a silent mentor and a master teacher. A new order of beings is being brought into creation. They begin in the Hue Expansion Ray plane above the realm of the silent mentors, above the realm of Agam Purusha, above the realm of the ocean of sound and light, source or prime creator. So beings who, who are going to be responsible for running a new kind of administration, you might say, are being trained here, if lack of a better word of using it. It's not so much training as taking on or having rubbed off on us the characteristics of very wonderful beings. So we get to experience a little bit this. And then we find ourselves collectively moving up the shaft of light above this mountain until we come all the way up through a number of other higher dimensions, which we won't get into it this time. 
and we come into the realm of Agam Purusha. As we exit this beam and come out, step out of this beam, which continues upward, we're in a fiery realm of orange and yellow and red and green and blue light moving around, swirling, manifesting, coming out, reforming, disappearing. And there's a massive white, it's got all the colors of the rainbow, but it's predominantly white golden. It's bigger than a silent mentor. It's approaching us. When I first met this being, I asked to be his friend. This guy has an aloneness. He doesn't feel loneliness like we do, but he's the sole being running, channeling the raw power from above, from the source or prime creator, and transforming it down into the lower planes. His presence is behind and in the entire omnipresent you. I can't explain it other than that. So he's here to greet us, and he tells you all telepathically with this beautiful, benevolent voice. It has a voice like a male, but it has feminine qualities to it. And then you look in the distance, and there's this silver tree, massive silver tree, roots going down into this light and disappearing, top of the tree disappearing above the heavens. And each needle on the branch of this perfect silver tree, massive fir tree, is a location somewhere in the lower worlds of time and space and a location in the worlds above. And if you look into one of these needles, you could actually teleport directly to that location. Silent mentors move about this way. This is the tree of life. We're going inside the trunk of it, moving right through the branches. We are atmos after all. We're still in a beautiful, brighter, oval white sphere of light. Let's come back on. Torellians in the center. And we're moving up the trunk of this tree, which is all energy, moving up and down, constantly in motion. And we're shot up at tremendous speed. When we come out the other end of that opening, we're looking at what looks to be this incredibly huge silver golden galaxy floating in an even brighter cobalt blue void everywhere around it. No planets, no moons, no suns, no stars. They aren't needed here. Everything here produces its own tremendous light because we're source. And in the distance you can see in this floating galaxy, it looks like what you thought were stars are individual beings revolving around it, like stars revolve around the center of a galaxy. That's where this form was taken from originally, to make galaxies from here. The sound coming from here cannot be described in human terms. It is beyond any orchestra you can imagine. It flows right through you, if you want to call it your heart the white core of your being, here you don't have a physical looking perfect form. Only the pure atma can journey here. So it's been withdrawn into the white core of your being for now. And we are moving through these beings and the space between them is like the distance between two stars. It's just massive. And as we pass as a group of beings between them heading toward the center nucleus of this place, we recognize that we are one of the beings circling this center and we're still there. We never left. So you see, when they say the lower worlds of time and space are kind of an illusion, this is what they mean. It's very real to people that are running bodies in it, made of matter in it, but it isn't the reality of life itself, the source. In the center of these beings where we're moving very quickly is a smaller void. And in the center of that void is a white island. Hovering above it is this massive source or prime creator. We look like it on a much smaller scale, but we're made of exactly the same energy. It is not a man on a throne or a woman or anything like this. This is source, prime creator, which is what beings from other worlds who know this 
speak respectfully of it in this way. They do not call it a supreme being because that implies a tyrant, a king. You don't do his bidding, you get the pitchfork and you're off to hell, so to speak. That's only teachings that are brainwashed into people in the lower worlds. It, isn't, there, it doesn't exist up here in a real heaven. As we're moving towards this island, you find that in the center of this being, it has more levels and comprehensible numbers of levels of teardrops. And yet we are made of the same thing. So this white golden light that surrounds us that Torellian and others created for this venture vanishes. And as individual atmas, we move between the teardrops of the ancient one, silent, what we call prime creator or source. And in the core of it, the white core, the beings we are and the white core we are merge right into it. We're still individuals. We're still the white core. It looks exactly as the source energy itself. Now, this is the realm of the ocean of sound and light. This is prime creator. This is source. There are several dimensions above here. Now, when we're in the middle of this, recognizing where we came from, there's no individual being here. It is a conscious presence of combined of all atmos that exist in all the levels of creation from the higher worlds to the lower planes, connected together telepathically. And it has a presence and you can speak with it, and you'll hear a deep baritone voice with a feminine quality. It cannot be described in human terms. And it welcomes you home again. And then we find ourselves back hovering above the tower in the Hugh Expansion Ray Academy. We cannot go or stay in the highest realms very long, too far removed from the lower worlds of time and space your body would perish. So there's you still up here, and there's you running bodies in the different planes below the void. But we come from here. This is how we were before the lower worlds of time and space we helped construct were built. This is where the trap or the illusion, unintended to be a trap, of good and evil began. And it evolved over a long period of time to be the trap that it is. It did not happen overnight. So when we plug ourselves into the source and hear its welcome home, a bit of it rubs off on us because there's a fluid energy moving between all of us. And we find ourselves all the way down by planet Earth, around Torellian. We're going one other place on this journey. We're going to go to planet Ziatranaman 1, the image of the artistry that's behind me in the video. Looks like this. Earth-like planets rings around it, dome city in the distance between two mesas. It's four times bigger than Earth. That moon and three other, two others, the size of Earth, none of them have polar ice caps because these worlds circle what's called a trinary sun system. Three suns. Big one, slightly smaller one, sometimes a red giant or a small red dwarf that circle, or another white, yellow sun, the bigger sun. This is a trinary sun system. You're going to find much more evolved beings on such worlds, most of which in the galaxy we call the Milky Way are binary or trinary, not a single sun like the one we're used to. And you find yourself walking along a violet luminous river because all water, all H2O in these worlds that are normal glow. They're charged with the hue. The beings are conscious on these worlds. They maintain the charge of the hue in their water. They never get subconscious minds. They don't get trapped. 
And as we're walking along this snake-like river, down the valley between mesas, we're approached by two 10-foot tall beings. So that means we're all on the path together, Trillian standing off to the side. He's still 18 feet tall here. The man's a little bit taller. These beings are humanoid. They have kind of ivory scolored skin, violet eyes, beautiful, longer torsos, longer necks, longer fingers, longer legs, because they're 10 feet tall. And when they walk, they walk like swans, very elegant. And they stop on the path and Torellian greets them. They look up, greet him, and they begin to talk with us. Now this is, the man's name is Zanantalus, and the woman's name is Fres Umuntis. Almost sounds Egyptian, doesn't it? They are of the Zantarnamus race originated and evolved in the galaxy five galaxies away from us and came here to this world. Zantarnamon one has three moons around it. It's on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. The bodies that they're showing you are real physical bodies. Not slightly pointed ears. They have hair like silver metal, like shiny silver metal, but it's soft. This couple have had these bodies immortalized for three and a half million years, unaged. Different than what Torellian and his race did. Because these are masters of genetic science. They know all the genomes on the DNA. They have four-stranded DNA. And all the genomes are turned on in them, not turned off like some of them in people on Earth. Telomeres on their DNA when cells divide do not shrink. So we're in the presence of beings like us, the Atma hovering above them, build bigger than us, very beautiful, to experience their energy. They're not here to try to teach us anything like on a chalkboard or a computer. The hue coming down through into this world is very high. Off in the distance, you can see a golden, luminous ocean. Way off to the left, it's glowing a foot above the calm waves. They're asking you to go over, to reach down and pick up some of this vi uh, lavender violet colored sand that's on this path, winding along this pastel lavender glowing river. And you feel these, these things in your hand because you have a human-like body here, right? And they're glowing amethyst type crystals. Now this has a lot to do with remembering lives in the etheric and above and in the higher world a transformative type of energy. So these little crystals go into the palm of your hand, up through the smiling face, into the white core of your being, and out to that violet layer near the outside of the Atma. Turns on a few of those teardrops too. There's a certain wisdom being imparted to you as a gift to help you understand how to utilize such energy without screwing yourself up or others again. Very important. They'll place their hand like Galactic Alliance people do on their chest and nod. And then we find ourselves in space around Torellium, looking at Earth. That's polar ice caps, barren moon. And we find ourselves on a Emerald green beach, big half moon shaped beach. It's at the bottom 
third of the way up from the South Pole of a huge continent on planet Earth, but it's Earth in a third higher parallel dimension. And we are on a beach, Torellian standing up to his knees in calm blue-green ocean water glowing. There's a jungle, massive trees behind us, and in the distance a single snow-capped mountain. Blue stone with white snow. On the left side is a waterfall cascading out of a cavern opening two-thirds of the way towards the summit. It's dropping down a sheer cliff face and disappearing behind these blue-green forest trees that surround the backside of a clear dome covering a small city. The dome's big, but there's not a lot of people here. There's three golden-sided pyramids off to the left third, an oval blue-green lake luminous, semicircular mountain range with waterfalls come out of cavern openings glowing, pouring into this lake and little dome dwellings, ivory-colored dome dwellings all over the countryside, little white marble paths. There's an ivory-colored dome, long, kind of a elongated oval, at the base between the three pyramids, and those are laboratories, scientific research centers. Standing on this path, all of us are on a path looking at this lake, and Master Opelum appears before us. Now, he works here as well as in Oceana, which is his home planet on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, also in the third higher parallel dimension of the physical universe where this Earth is. There are no pollutants in the atmosphere, none in the water. Galactic Alliance personnel, master teachers, certain Seyres like Terillium, silent mentors work here. The moon circling this planet that has no polar ice caps, is alive with atmosphere. No polar ice caps, like our moon, but water and oceans and little dome cities turning on its axis as it revolves around the planet. This is a prototype, because at one point, Earth and its dead moon will change. They will be coming from here. This is a place that has never been destroyed by polar flips, as Earth's people and surfaces have many times. Polar flips of Earth were suspended by silent mentors a few years ago, so they will not happen again. Things are changing. The gift of that emerald green sand comes from the Zianternamus couple you met on their home world. And its purpose is to help you remember lives you've lived in other worlds that were high in intelligence, long lived thousands of years. Things that would benefit you intelligence wise, wisdom wise, courage wise, when they rub off on you and you bring them back to earth. So now, we find ourselves in space looking at the Earth you're familiar with. We never left. And then you're hovering near the ceiling with this man and woman beside you, looking down on your body in the trance state called sleep. The energy we bring back here is of a white golden light nature of the hue. Passes through us, through the body, goes out into the Earth's atmosphere into three pyramids, two at the bottom of Earth's deepest oceans, one in the side of hollowed out interior of a mountain in the Malayas, and then out into space, into our solar system, to a bigger pyramid, stationed stably between two stationary asteroids, circling in the orbit of a planet between Mars and Jupiter, in the asteroid field. And then it's beamed out into space, it goes through other pyramids and it arrives at the central axis, the golden white shaft of light that runs through the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. It's not only not a black hole, it's a brilliant shaft of light. Uh, human eyes can't see it, so it appears black. But as in the Atma, you can. And then it goes back to source, where we just came from. And it never stops moving. So it passes through us for our benefit and moves onward for the benefit of others. This is our co-creative nature. We're back home. When you're ready, open your eyes.
And you can turn on your mics. Pretty long journey, hour and 45 minutes, I guess, but worth it. I wish they could be shorter, but then it wouldn't be as benefiting for you if they were. I'm going to stop the recording to end this journey.